exactly. I think the intro, okay, we're recording and I can't see the chat, but I can see myself and some people. So I'll monitor the chat. Sounds good. Thanks, Eve. So hi, everybody. We're going to get started. And uh, let me just ask before we start, did anybody um, offer to Roberta Keller to introduce Betsy Crouch? Is there anybody on who got that assignment? If nobody's volunteering, then we're going to ask Betsy to introduce herself because she will. she's best uh, positioned to tell you all about her background. Betsy. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks to Roberta, who um, is in Paris, we all realized. Um, so good for her. But she, um, you know, kindly gave me the invitation to speak today. Uh, I am going to, for those of you who've seen me speak before, um, I've been, you know, lucky to be really well supported here at UCSF. And I'm very grateful to continue um, to work here. Uh, I'm going to put in some very fresh data. So, you know, please excuse me for that. But I also, you know, wanted to stimulate some discussion. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Betsy Crouch, and I um, obtained my MD-PhD from Columbia. Um, after I graduated from there, I had a, um, a really fortunate conversation with David Rowich, who at time, the time was the neonatology division chief at, here at UCSF, and he told me that if I wanted to be a physician scientist in neonatology, I had to come to UCSF. He, after that, um, left us to, to go be the department chair of pediatrics at Cambridge, but I've always been very grateful to him for that piece of advice because he was spot on. Um, I did my residency and I fast-tracked into fellowship um, in neonatology here at UCSF. Uh, I did the PSS, PSDP program, the National K-12 um, Award that's now run by Sally Permar. That was just really instrumental in how I, you know, positioned and thought about myself as a physician scientist. And then I was very fortunate to be awarded the UCSF PSSP um, uh, in 2020 and started my own small group there in the stem cell building in the Broad Stem Cell Center. And that's where my lab is located now. So today, the topic of my talk is angiogenesis and neurogenesis in the prenatal human brain. And as I understand the convention is for this seminar, um, I'll ask you to please hold your questions until the end, and I'll try to leave, you know, a good five to 10 minutes for discussion. So in the Crouch Lab, we study uh, brain vasculature. And much more than passive conduits for oxygen and nutrient delivery, vascular cells are emerging as a signaling hub of the neurovascular unit. Our perspective is similar to the 17th century Dutch anatomist Frederick Reusch, who said that blood vessels are ubiquitous and tissues are only blood vessels that are variously arranged. If you're unconvinced by the Dutch anatomist, the blood vessels are most more than passive conduits. Look at the recent literature on this topic. So on the this is and this is also kind of a an area of strength for UCSF. So I'll point out a lot of my um, esteemed colleagues in this area. So this is um, Ethan Winkler's paper here. And let me get out my pointer. There we go. This is Ethan Winkler's paper here um, with Dan Lim, who's a, also a neurosurgeon along with Ethan and Tom Nowakowski, um, who studied or who published a single cell atlas of the normal and malformed adult brain, human brain vasculature. This was published last year. Um, in addition, here's Andrew Yang's paper, who himself is a Sandler fellow, um, who also has a lab here at UCSF. And he, when he was a grad student in Tony Weiss Corey's lab at Stanford, published this paper, um, also published last year, um, called A Human Brain Vascular Atlas Reveals Diverse Meteors of Alzheimer's Risk, Performing Single Cell RNA Sequencing on Adult Human Brain Vasculature and um, Alzheimer's Cases. Um, and we recently added to this topic, describing the prenatal human brain vasculature and data that I'll discuss today. So in part, my interest in this topic began as a stem cell biologist interested in how neurovascular interactions affect stem cell behavior. So there's a lot that has been published in neurovascular interactions for a long time, but we arrived on this topic recently in a collaboration with Juliet Alfonso's lab in Germany. And like many good stories, this one started with an observation. And these are these beautiful philopodia, um, which are colored in gray from the vasculature which are contacting dividing neural stem cells, which their nuclei are colored in, in fuchsia in this diagram. Now this 
image is taken from the mouse ganglionic eminence. It's an um, area of the brain, which you'll hear much more about today. But in short, what we quantified here was the philopodial contacts with the dividing neural progenitors and found that in fact, it was statistically significant and that this interaction increased over time. Now in trying to discern why we had these contacts, we then uh, moved to the human brain um, where now we switched up the markers, but the vasculature in these pictures um, are, are in white. And you can see, we also saw abundant philopodia in the vasculature in the human um, same region, the ganglionic eminence. And um, we quantified this interaction and also saw that there was a statistically significant relationship between the philopodia and the dividing neural stem cells. So in sum, we created this model at the end of this paper where the radial glia, the stem cells in this region, they secrete a molecule called VEGF, which makes the philopodia from the vasculature extend. And in mouse models, we were able to manipulate the number of philopodia. And we found that when there were too many philopodia, that this caused the um, neural stem cells to prematurely exit the cell cycle and generate um, neurons at the expense overall of cell renewal. So there are many other examples, but this is just one from our work to highlight how tightly coordinated angiogenesis and neurogenesis are in the developing brain. Now, in addition to a stem cell biologist, in my work as a neonatologist, I take care of premature babies. And unfortunately, um, one of the sequelae from their prematurity that happens relatively frequently is something called intraventricular or germinal matrix hemorrhage. Now, this unfortunately, again, occurs to 20% of our youngest babies. So ELBW stands for extremely low birth weight. We generally think of this in the babies um, who are born less than 30 gestational weeks. It's very stereotyped to occur under the cortex next to the ventricles. This is the region called the GE, which I was just showing you in the previous images. Um, and this region will become over time, the caudate and the thalamus. This um, condition occur, uh, carries a high risk of mortality and morbidity um, and is associated with intellectual disability and cerebral palsy. We have no disease, disease modifying treatments as many of you are probably aware. Now the outcomes after severe GMH are poor, and just to again review briefly for those of you who aren't familiar with this condition, um, a grade four hemorrhage has now been um, renamed a PVHI, which is periventricular hemorrhagic infarction. Um, when the babies have especially a bilateral grade four or PVHI hemorrhage, this carries a 40% mortality rate and also has a very high cerebral palsy rate. Practically, this means many of these children with a severe hemorrhage will likely never walk and may never talk and have intellectual disability. So why do we have no treatment for the hemorrhage? Well, this is a difficult area to study. So these are gross pathological specimens um, in, in specimens without hemorrhage um, collected from my postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Eric Wong. And uh, these were images were published in a beautiful paper by, by Mercedes Paredes et al. that I'll reference a couple times in this talk that was published in Science last year. So in these gross pathological specimens, we've highlighted in the coronal sections beneath the area that constitutes the ganglionic eminence, also called the germinal matrix, the area which is prone to hemorrhage. And I hope you can appreciate in these images how the GE takes up proportionally more surface area at the younger gestational ages. And then over time by 33 gestational weeks, there's only a remnant left. And perhaps this developmental timeframe underlies some of the vulnerability of this region to hemorrhage. So we're starting to study these structures in humans. Mercedes Peretti's paper was one of the first. We also do know more about these structures from mouse. So these are this is um, a schema of the developing mouse brain. And here are coronal sections where the lateral ganglionic eminence, LGE, medial ganglionic eminence, and caudal ganglionic eminence has, have been highlighted. And in general, these structures will produce the majority of GABA-containing interneurons, which are born in this region and then migrate up and integrate into the cortical circuitry. But let's take a step back. Where do brain vascular cells come from and how do they develop? So these images are from Tom Arnold's paper where he labeled blood vessel cells with um, uh, CD31 in green and showed that this is about halfway through mouse gestation, that the blood vessels start outside of the brain in what's called a per perineural vascular plexus. They dive in and then elaborate up to the um, most dorsal and then further the most medial aspects of the developing brain. And then they elaborate out with the growing neural tissue. 
But when I started in this work during my fellowship now six years ago, there was very little known about human brain vascular development, and that's where we decided to focus our efforts. So here's our outline for today. And first we're gonna discuss angiogenesis and the human GE. This is also a shameless plug for a review that actually just um, came out last week online in Trends in, in Trends in Neurosciences, where we highlighted all of the recent work using single cell RNA sequencing in the human brain. And I encourage you to dive into it if this piques your interest. Now to study vascular cells in the developing human brain, my lab focuses on two main cell types, endothelial cells, which can compose the lumen of blood vessels throughout the body. And in addition, these endothelial cells in the brain are connected by tight junctions, which are important for the blood-brain barrier. Mural cells are an umbrella term that I use to include pericytes, smooth muscle cells, and fibroblasts, although the latter inclusion is controversial. In general, these are a heterogeneous, relatively undefined support cell population. We know that they're required for the formation of the blood-brain barrier, and on the opposite end of the life spectrum, they've been implicated in neurodegeneration, although many of these studies have been performed in mouse. So to investigate blood vessel cells during human development, we first started performing immunostaining in sections from the early second trimester, ganglionic eminence. This is that region again prone to hemorrhage. So I'll abbreviate ganglionic eminence, GE, and here's a schema of a hemicronal section of the developing human brain, and these pictures are taken by the, in the area highlighted in the red box. So first we use CD31, which is uh, you know, a well-known cell surface marker for endothelial cells. We used NG2 to label mural cells. It works well for them, I'll say before 30 gestational weeks. After that, it starts to label what we think are um, oligodendrocytes. And so after that, it gets complicated. Now PDGFR beta is the canonical mural cell marker, but in the human brain, it's complicated because it also labels um, radial glia, which are the neural stem cells. So just focusing on the NG2, something that was very apparent when we first looked at this data was this, that there's a prominence of vascular cells, mural cells specifically, located right next to the ventricular surface. And in addition, it's less dramatic, but the endothelial cells also seem to be um, preferentially enriched in this region. Now, looking over gestational timeframe, so at 22 gestational weeks, um, you can see similar patterns where there's a predominance of CD31 and NG2 localized next to the ventricle. But by 39 gestational weeks, things are very different. So now we think NG2 and PDGFR beta are labeling glial cells right, located right next to the ventricle, but CD31 is still very good um, to label endothelial cells. To quantify this data, we divided up the GE into three regions based on the different neural progenitors that can be found in this region. Zone one is also called the ventricular zone. This is filled with densely packed um, uh, radial glial neural stem cells. Zone two was the subject of Mercedes Peretti's paper. These are areas which look like they have holes in the tissue, but in fact, these are not holes. The regions which are filled, which are just negative for these immunostains um, and filled with those densely packed newly born neurons. And zone three are the areas lateral to zones one and two. So as you can appreciate by eye, we also saw when we quantified CD31 um, surface area by percentage that there's an enrichment in the ventricular zone, zone one, at the early and late part of the second trimester, but that this trend disappears by the time that babies might be born at term. And similarly, as you saw by eye, there's an enrichment of the mural cells also in the ventricular zone at the early part of the second trimester. So these are high powered confocal images emphasizing the vascular gradient. And then we did an Ameris rendering um, on the right um, showing the NG2 expression in a gradient of expression, um, in a gradient of colors with red denoting high expression right at the ventricular surface and the cooler colors a little bit further back from the ventricle um, shown, shown beneath in this region. At this magnification, you may also be able to see more detailed features of the vasculature, such as the endothelial philopodia that are poking out right next to the um, ventricular surface. To focus on these philopodia, which of course I talked about at the beginning of the, um, of the seminar as well, here's another video. This, the top of the ventricular surface is here. And now I have the endothelial philopodia in green and the overlying mural cells in blue. And this is just zooming into different regions to help you appreciate how many more philopodia there are at the ventricular surface. 
So when we quantified this data, we saw that, again, as you can see by eye, that there are more filopodia in the ventricular zone um, compared to zones two and three, about the early and the late part of the second trimester. And this allowed us to start having a hypothesis about what was going on in this region. So we know that the ventricular zone is the canonical neurogenic niche with the build with abundant radial glia. But this data allowed us to start to generate the hypothesis that this was also an angiogenic niche. And angiogenic vasculature should also be have more branch points. So we quantified that um, parameter and saw also that there was increased branching. So in addition to increased in addition to increased filopodia and branching, angiogenic vasculature should also be dividing or proliferating. So to test um, uh, this parameter, we performed immunostaining with CD31 and PDGFR beta, as well as KS67. Many cells, including the neural cells, are dividing in these regions. These are um, immunohistochemistry using a confocal microscope. And here is an Ameris rendering showing uh, this area of this vasculature. Um, highlighting that you can see a dividing endothelial cell um, right captured right here. And when we quantified this, there are very few um, dividing vascular cells in general, and especially, you know, vascular cells are only 10 to 15% of the surface area, but we're, a we're able to find a statistically significant enrichment for them in the ventricular zone, as well as for the mural cells. And we did an Ameris rendering of a dividing mural cell here captured from this vasculature region in II. Now, we were also fortunate in these experiments to be able to collaborate um, with a Spanish group, uh, Garcia uh, Manuel Verdugo Lab, um, based in Spain, as well as Arturo Alvarez Buya. And the postdoc who was doing the analysis was a wonderful scientist called Arancha um, Silla. And here I'm showing uh, transmission electron microscopy from 17 gestational weeks and 23 gestational weeks. And something I thought was really striking about these images is that here she's highlighted the blood vessels in fuchsia. And, and what was really noticeable is that there are very few vascular lumen in this region. And of course, angiogenic vasculature is also not patent. It's not having blood flow through it yet because that would be devastating, obviously. Um, so what we were able to see is just that there are very few lumens in the ventricular zone and even in the inner subventricular zone at 17 gestational weeks, but by 23 gestational weeks, now we're starting to see some patent lumen in this area. So again, just, just able to capture the angiogenesis process in different snapshots. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, I'm going to show this uh, schema that was um, nicely made for us by a woman called Sarah Pyle, where she uh, is capturing the vasculature in terms of tiles, which are making up this region. And here I've highlighted with arrows the different angiogenic subtypes of vascular cells, which are um, found enriched in the ventricular zone, at least during the second trimester. So these initial histological observations made us curious to use orthogonal techniques to study the vasculature, including the now popular FACS, flow cytometry, and single cell RNA sequencing. Now this is a TISNI plot from a single cell RNA sequencing data um, from a paper published now six years ago from the Kriegstein lab at UCSF to interrogate individual cells in the developing human brain from six gestational weeks to full term. But I've highlighted here with this arrow that there were very few vascular cells captured in this entire data set. And up until last year, there were very few vascular cells in any data set because as you could see from the previous data, they just compose a small part of the overall um, cellular composition of the brain. So we needed to develop a way to enrich for them. Um, you know, here I'm skipping a lot of data, but in short, we decided to use flow cytometry, which of course is a, is a way to use cell surface markers that are present on the cells to be able to um, use fluidics and capture them and then study them in more detail. So I'm not showing the flow cytometry plots here that include the debris, dead cells, and doublets. But what we decided to do was use CD45 um, conjugated to a fluorophore called PE7, which is what the machine uses to, to separate out these populations. Um, this allows us to separate out microglia as well as um, perivascular macrophages, as well as some um, small population of infiltrating immune cells in the, in the, divide, in the uh, developing human brain. And I give these to other people who are interested in studying those cell types. I'm interested in the CD45 negative cells, which then I can use AMPEP ABC on the y-axis and CD31 conjugated to a fluorophore called Alexa 48 on the x-axis to pull out distinct populations of mural and endothelial cells. 
So these are UMAPs summarizing the single cell RNA sequencing data of approximately 150,000 endothelial um, and mural cells. So each dot in these plots represents an individual cell. And we were first very pleased to see um, that in this data set, which is using seven uh, cases, all from the second trimester, that endothelial and mural cells, um, they know who, who they are and they're able to separate into their um, uh, cell type identities. In these plots, which is a way to uh, reduce all of the dimensionality of single cell RNA sequencing data, you have cells which are similar to one another in the RNA molecules that they're expressing, their transcriptomes are localized right next to each other. Now, interestingly, we set up these experiments to understand the difference between the GE, the vasculature, which is prone to hemorrhage, and the cortex, which is a control region. But we really didn't find anything that is that significant yet, and I'm happy to talk about that in further detail. Similarly, we, we found some sub, subtle differences by age that we're now going into more detail by, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about it um, today. I did want to offer that we put this data up on a publicly available um, web browser, and so you know everybody can look up their fa favorite gene of interest and sort of correlate which subtype might be expressing it in the second trimester of human brain. If you don't know about the cells.ucsc.edu um, resource, it's a phenomenal resource with many different cell browsers. Um, and so I was uh, talking to somebody studying glioblastoma the other day and interested in the role of the vasculature in that regard. And we were able to look up a glioblastoma single cell RNA sequencing database as well. So first let's focus on the different subtypes that we found um, in the second trimester of human brain. Again, here are some UMAPs um, showing all the different data. And when we looked at this, our first question was, we know that there are arteries and veins and capillaries throughout the body, but will we see these distinct subtypes as early as the second trimester? And in, and in fact, we could find them already this early. So here's our group of cells, which are predominantly arterial endothelial cells. Here are capillaries, here are veins. And then we pulled out um, some subtypes which are specific to development, such as mitotic endothelial cells. And the tip cells are the ones with the abundant filopodia. So we were grateful to see that they actually appeared in our database as well. If anyone is curious, I have feature plots showing the specific genes that we used um, here and um, on this slide. And I'll note that um, you know this is development, so no gene expression here is strictly on and off. So there's a gradient of expression of many of these genes. So then we needed to use RNA scope, which is just a fancy in situ hybridization to be able to localize these cells um, to validate the bioinformatics. So here's a schema of a hemicoronal section from the second trimester human brain, specifically 17 to 20, 7, 15 to 17 gestational weeks. And you know, in this um, area that I'm capturing one, which is a little bit um, back from the ventricular zone in the ganglionic eminence, you can see that here are some um, beautiful individual puncta, um, which is uh, the RNA ADGRG6, which in our data set we found is a venous capillary marker. Next, um, when I was looking for tip cells, we used uh, the RNA molecules adrenomedulin and angiopoietin 2 to label these cells, and we were happy to see that indeed they were localized right in these blood vessels, which are right next to the ventricular surface, as they should be based on our histology. And finally, when we looked for arterial endothelial cells, we found them outlining individual, the cytoplasm of individual cells in a beautiful way in this bigger blood vessel, which is a little bit back from the ventricular surface. So then very little is known actually about the way that these um, vascular cells mature. I think about it a lot as a neuroscientist that we know the canonical developmental trajectory of neural cells that you have radial glia, which are the stem cells that then go through an intermediate state and give rise to neurons as well as you know, other, other cell types over time. But the, the maturation trajectory of the vascular cells is, is still not well um, clarified. So as a first pass to, un to get at this question, we use something called RNA velocity, which is an algorithm bioinformatically that looks at the pre-splice to splice mRNA ratios to understand who's a more immature and who's a more mature cell. So we looked at two of our cases separately, the 15 and 23 gestational weight cases. And in both of our data sets, we saw that there are mitotic or venous cells, which are more stem cell-like, which then give rise to a capillary intermediate, and that arterial endothelial cells are the most differentiated, at least in our data set. And this was gratifying because in previous morphological observations um, in uh, different model systems like zebrafish, people have 
have shown that, that this is the way that, that it seems to go morphologically. So now we have some single cell RNA sequencing data um, that is in line with those observations as well. Moving on to the mural cells, I wanted to provide a little bit of a primer on these cells because they're less talked about. So here, um, Christer Betschholz is a scientist um, based in, in Sweden, and he's really the, the godfather of all of the pericytes. And so these are um, from some of his papers. On the left is a review where his focus is really on the pericyte, which is this mural cell found in the capillary microvasculature. But as you go back to the bigger um, blood vessels, the arteries, these are certainly smooth muscle cells. The cell type that's this intermediate between the smooth muscle cells and the pericytes, I'll just say is very controversial, as well as the, the um, mural cells, which are found on the postcard capillary venules and the venules. These, some people call them venous smooth muscle cells, but they aren't very well defined at all. In addition, in a single cell RNA sequencing paper that looked at the adult mouse vasculature, um, they uh, were able to capture this new fibroblast-like cell type, which is found in the bigger blood vessels, the arteries and the veins, again, in the adult mouse brain. So using the marker genes from this data set, we then looked back at our data set to see what type of um, mural cells we had in the second trimester. And we were able to identify the smooth muscle cells, the classic pericytes, as well as a small population of fibroblasts. And um, in addition, captured a, a larger group of mitotic mural cells, which again was consistent with our histology. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show you all of the RNA scope for this, um, but you can find it in the paper if you're, um, if you're so inclined. But I will show this movie that I really like where we did RNA scope for ATP1A2 and KCNJ8, which are classic pericyte markers, which should be found in these smaller blood vessels, especially I put in an arrow at the one which was uh, found at the branch points. And uh, you know we saw that they localized as we expected them to, which was great. In addition, of course, this marker is not exclusive to the vasculature. We saw ATP1A2 expressing cells um, in other areas of the brain, which, which we think are likely new neurons. Now the stages of mural cell development um, in the brain had not been shown in any animal model um, to date at the time that we published this paper. And so we also wanted to use RNA velocity to try to understand the maturation trajectory of these cells. And again, looking at the 15 and the 23 gestational week case, um, what we saw was there's a mitotic group of mural cells, which then seems to give rise to smooth muscle cells. And then there's a small group of classic pericytes, um, which are present at 15 gestational weeks, and by 23 gestational weeks, now you can see that there's um, you know, a, a nice flow from the smooth muscle cells to the classic pericytes. This is something that we're um, working on currently because I'll just say that in the mouse heart, this is not the way the trajectory goes. Christy Redhorse is a brilliant scientist who uh, did her PhD here at UCSF and now is at Stanford and HHMI funded. And she showed that in the mouse heart, it, it goes the opposite way. The classic pericytes are the progenitors for smooth muscle cells. Um, so, you know, I think this is very exciting, but now we're um, trying to do some functional as well as histological assays to understand if, if this is just, it could be a bioinformatic um, kind of quirk, but, but we don't think so for a couple of reasons um, that I can get into. Now on the horizon, one of the ways that we're starting to validate this is using um, this new tech called Hyplex RNA scope. I'd shown you the, the RNA scope um, previously for where we could do two probes at the same time, along with some immunohistochemistry. But I have a wonderful master student in the lab now whose name is Edward Valenzuela. And he's starting to do this high-flex RNA scope um, experiments where we can do 12 probes simultaneously. So here's a picture um, of the developing human brain. Here's dorsal and ventral um, and medial and lateral. This is an image that he's taken using these hyplex RNA scope probes, and he's capturing the blood vessels in different regions. And here, of course, is a ganglionic eminence. So here's a zoomed in image of one of these blood vessels um, that he's capturing here, where you can appreciate the, um, the different RNA scope probes in this bigger blood vessel, which is kind of caught, um, caught uh, cut tangentially. And then another one here, which is more uh, parallel to the tissue section. So here are some of the individual RNA scope um, probes. We're doing a number of different um, pan mural cell markers here, PDGFR beta. We've all found a new marker, IRGS5, which seems to work really well at the RNA scope level, but there isn't an antibody. So this has been really helpful. 
and then using some specific markers for subtypes and trying to parse out where are the different subtypes present and how do they appear over time in the human brain. Specifically, I'll, I'll say that SDC2 is a new smooth muscle cell marker that we found, as well as ACTA2, smooth muscle actin, which is kind of the canonical one. And we were very pleased to see that in this bigger blood vessel, which is likely an artery or an arterial, we have abundant SDC2 and smooth muscle actin um, RNA puncta showing up. But here's a smaller blood vessel down here, which has PDGFR beta and RGS5, uh, and um, but is absent for the smooth muscle cell markers. So that's good, and this was encouraging. So we're using this technique to map out um, all of the different mural cells, and that's work that's ongoing. So in addition, we wanted to use this data to think about the ways that endothelial and mural cells might communicate with one another to um, create the vasculature, and maybe particularly the blood-brain barrier in the second trimester. So to do this, um, this was uh, work from Claire Howard, um, who at the time was a pediatrics resident at UCSF, and um, she was in the molecular medicine program, and she had a month uh, to do uh, a little bit of lab research time. And so she figured out bioinformatically how to run this algorithm and created this beautiful plot. So what we did was um, using, again, our RNA sequencing data, this plot is mapping the number of significant interactions. And what was really interesting was that we, when we looked at this, to understand the interactions between endothelial and mural cells, the collagen and lamin signaling pathways are the ones that came up as the most enriched. And this was also very gratifying because as many of you likely know that mutations in COL4A can be associated with severe uh, intracranial hemorrhages that can present at birth. And so this molecular data now casts some light on why that is. Collagen is so important. It's the number one signaling pathway in the second trimester human brain. So mutations in one of these signaling subunits would be expected then to be very detrimental. So in addition, trying to understand some of the blood-brain barrier, we did find some of these adherence junction proteins like the JAMS, PECAM1 is also, it's an endothelial marker, but it's also an adherence junction proteins, um, as well as some of the coherence. These are further down um, in terms of our number of significant interactions, but they're still present. I think this was starting to hint that the blood brain barrier must be fairly immature during this time. And then finally, the tight junction proteins, the occludins and the claudins are present, but again, they're, they're um, much less significant or much less abundant. So I think this is all hinting that the blood brain barrier is very immature at this time point, as has been suggested by others for a long time, but now we have molecular data for this. So in addition, we went back to our um, trans transmission electron microscopy to corroborate these data. Um, and this is just showing uh, a blood vessel from the 17 gestational week human brain. Um, and here are some of the different um, adherence junctions which are present, but I'm not showing an example from the, the um, adult human brain, but the adherence junctions are supposed to be surrounding the entire vascular cell. So they're present, but they're again, like much smaller and less um, than, uh, than expected for a mature blood brain barrier. Um, in addition, we know that another way molecularly that the blood-brain barrier is present is that the mural cell talks to the endothelial cell and really shuts down transcytosis, which is a way that the endothelial cell is bringing things in from the vascular lumen. But at this 17 gestational week case, we see pretty abundant evidence of transcytosis that's actively occurring. So again, this is other evidence just to, to promote the fact that the blood-brain barrier seems to be very immature. So finally, we wanted to start to do some functional experiments with these vascular cells. Um, and we decided to do a transplant into cortical organoids. So to perform these experiments, we took our FACTS paradigm, pulled out the endothelial of the mural cells. We labeled them with a virus, which is nonspecific and just makes all of the cells express GFP. And then put the vascular cells on top of organoids to understand how they develop and, and in one way model angiogenesis, so the growing vascular cells in a known neurogenic model, the cortical organoid. Um, we let these cells go two weeks in culture. At first, we were very pleased to see that the cells, they integrated, they seemed to be happy um, in these co-cultures. And then we went on to analyze them after two weeks. First, I'll show the data from the endothelial cells. So we knew based on the single cell RNA sequencing that we would start with five different subtypes of endothelial cells, arterial, venous, capillary, the tip cells, and the mitotic ones. But what was really interesting was when we transplanted them into this model after two weeks, the predominant subtype 
was entirely tip cells. So here I'm showing the RNA scope probes for adrenomedulin and angiopoietin 2. And here's a rough quantification on the right of the abundance of these probes. But this was really curious. And, and then we went back and read some of the organoid literature where we know that the organoids are predominantly radioglia. So again, this is really just recapitulating that ventricular zone where all the endothelial cells become a tip cell and the um, neural cells are predominantly radioglia. And we're hoping to use this in the future to um, study those interactions. Now with the mural cells, again, we knew based on the single cell RNA sequencing that we started with four different subtypes. But again, when we transplanted them in into this um, very radioglial heavy um, cortical organoid, we saw that they also had a, um, a favorite phenotype. So in the mural cell instance, it's the MYL9 and transgelin expressing smooth muscle cells. Um, and I quantified this on the right. Truthfully, we don't know a lot about the smooth muscle cells in this region. That's one of the reasons why we're doing that high flex RNA scope to try to map out where exactly they are. Um, and so hopefully I'll have a, a good explanation for you um, as to this phenotype in the future. So coming back to the schema, I've showed you using single cell RNA sequencing that there's a variety of different subtypes of vascular cells, which tile the prenatal human brain. And they do have some microregional specificity as shown in this nice schema by Sarah. Okay, so I think we're gonna move on now from the published data into some um, more emerging experiments. And again, um, with apologies for the fact that it's not as polished, but I'm very excited about this data. So one of the um, techniques that I've gotten really excited about, as has everyone, is spatial transcriptomics. Um, and it, to make a long story short, I, I investigated a number of different ways to do this, but currently we're using um, a panel from NanoString. And the reason is because NanoString is a pathology company. And again, like, I'm not getting any money from them. In fact, I've given them a lot of money to do these experiments. Um, but, but NanoString is a pathology company. And so we can use all of our um, archive samples. My postdoc mentor, Eric Wong, is a neuropathologist, and he's been banking samples from babies who's unfortunately passed away um, from our NICU for many years, but it's all fixed in PFA, and the technology to be able to do transcriptomics on PFA tissue has taken some time, um, but, but nanostring, I think, has really perfected it. So now what I've started to do is we were able to dissociate the cells and then get the single cell RNA sequencing, but then mapping them back to their micro regions has been more challenging. So this is a way that I can capture three different regions of interest in a, in a similar brain region. And the three different regions is for st uh, statistics. But now I can capture specifically the vascular transcriptome um, in this ventricular zone compared to the subventricular zone compared to these are bigger blood vessels, which are further out from the ventricular surface. And I can do this in the GE, which is prone to hemorrhage, of course, compared to the cortex in the same section. Here's some preliminary data. I think the other brilliant thing about this technology is that it allows us to do um, the segmentation just of the of the blood vessel cells compared to the surrounding regions. So here, for those of you who, who may be familiar, this is similar conceptually to laser capture microdissection, where we can pull out the vascular cells stained with CD31 and as well as some other um, mural cell markers and compare to the regions. Here's just proof of concept where I'm showing you, if you focus here on the PECAM1, this is the RNA, which was captured under what we're calling the vessel positive regions. And the specificity is just wonderful, where you can see there are high, re high amounts of the PECAM1 RNA captured under the CD31 positive immunostained blood vessels in all of our different regions of interest. So the question I really wanted to use this technique to um, query is that here again is just showing you um, the different types of blood vessel morphologies. This is a, a section from uh, uh, the 17 gestational week human brain where the blood vessels right here, remember, are the ones that are really angiogenic. They have all these philopodia, but the ones here are much more mature looking. And again, these areas which um, are look like the big holes in the tissue, so the areas which are um, filled with densely packed newly born neurons in the GE, which will go on to migrate up to the cortex and become inhibitory neurons. So this is showing, again, some preliminary data from doing the spatial transcriptomics, comparing the ganglionic eminence SVZ, so this region, to the ventricular zone, VZ, here. And what's really exciting is now we can start to understand 
the genetic programs which are underlying these different vascular phenotypes. So in the GE, we see things like degradation of the extracellular matrix and a lot of extracellular matrix organization, you know, associated with probably the very active filopodial state and the migration, the migratory capacity of these cells, as well as some aspects of, um, of cell prol proliferation as expected. In contrast, the ones that are in the SVZ are are expressing genes that are associated with transmembrane transport. Again, these are probably more um, mature blood-brain barrier related um, genes, but also there's something um, really exciting that we just found recently. So this is a heat map comparing our three different regions of interest that are in the ventricular zone compared to the subventricular zone. And there was this group of genes which are associated with GABA synthesis, release, reuptake, and degradation. So specifically, here's a feature plot of one of these genes, SLC6A12. And this is showing a gene that, again, is associated with GABA. And I was really excited to see that in our different subtypes of vascular cells, these classic pericytes and fibroblasts are ones that are found a little bit back from the ventricular surface. So that's good, this is all consistent. And I wanna remind you that again, this is the area that's filled with these densely packed and really born neurons. This is the schema from Mercedes paper. So I think this is suggesting that before the astrocytes come into this region, because astrocytes haven't been made yet in the 15 gestational week um, developing human brain, that potentially the mural cells are actually functioning in an astrocytic role. So helping to you know, uh, modulate the neurotransmission of these cells. And I think this is really exciting. So finally, I'll also end with some um, preliminary data talking about germinal matrix hemorrhage. Now to date, there has been some very nice um, uh, studies to understand the cellular mechanisms of germinal matrix hemorrhage, um, but we haven't really been able to build off of it. So I think I'm trying to work on this as well as some other awesome scientists, especially here at UCSF, like Mark Peterson. Um, so thus far, Praveen Balaba had done these studies. Um, here's one um, that he published in Journal of Neuroscience in 2007, where looking at the uh, second trimester human brain, here are sections from 17, 21, and 25 gestational weeks. He performed immunostaining for CD34 for the endothelial cells and NG2 for the mural cells. And it's quite apparent by eye, although there's no quantification here, that the um, blood vessels in the white matter, so the area not prone to hemorrhage, have much more mural cell um, investment compared to the ones in the GE at the same gestational age. And in addition, they did a stain for um, fibronectin in another publication, which is an extracellular matrix protein, and showed that there's less extracellular matrix present in the germinal matrix compared to the cortex. And, and now I think we can start to have this make sense based on our cellular trajectory. So I think that the pericytes are the more differentiated subtype. And this is all saying that for a long time, we thought that the ganglionic eminence, one of the reasons why it's prone to hemorrhage, is that the blood vessel cells in this region are immature. But now potentially, I think we can start to identify which cell types are mature or more immature and hopefully move towards way to start protecting or accelerating the maturation of the less mature cells. In addition, we have some data um, using the same facts to single cell RNA sequencing paradigm of two cases that were generously donated um, from families after their baby un unfortunately passed away with a severe germinal matrix hemorrhage where we uh, collected the endothelial and mural cells as I described previously. This is a UMAP um, laying out the different um, cells. And here I'm just showing data um, integrating these cases with our 23 gestational week control cases, which is our closest age match control. And we were happy to see that the vascular cells, um, they can be studied after this terrible hemorrhage, but that you know we can still pull them out and they, they um, have good data. But as we looked more carefully at the different subtypes which are present, um, we saw that there seems to be a notable absence or certainly a decrease in the number of mitotic um, endothelial and mural cells. Um, this potentially makes sense because of course, I just showed you that the mitotic cells are the ones more present in the ventricular zone, but there also might be some underlying metabolic um, vulnerabilities here. And that's something we're trying to understand with our single cell RNA sequencing data also. In addition, so for a long time, based on clinical data, it's been hypothesized that, that hypoxia or potentially a hypoxia reperfusion injury is also contributing to germinal matrix hemorrhage. And when we did a differential expression analysis, looking at the difference between our control and our germinal matrix hemorrhage cases shown here in a volcano plot, 
we saw that there was um, this uh, increase in oxygen um, oxygen levels and some hypoxia or HIP-1 signaling that's upregulated in the germinal matrix hemorrhage cases. So in addition, I apologize for this very busy slide, but now we're looking at um, comparing our germinal matrix hemorrhages to all our control cases. And we're starting to see things, um, you know, again, oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial, membrane organization, and some reactive oxygen species substantiating the hypoxia idea or some dysregulation in the oxygen tension, as well as hinting at metabolic vulnerabilities that we're trying to follow up now. Um, and here are some feature plots just showing um, uh, some of these genes that we're interested in specifically, like HIF1A. Um, HIF2 is also called EPAS1. Um, the E here stands for endothelial, so it's known to be an, um, a vascular-specific HIF isoform that might be underlying some of this vulnerability, and here's HIF3A. And I'll um, also give some appreciation to Emin Maltepe, who's been helping us kind of figure out next steps for this um, data with his expertise in hypoxia. Um, and one final note is that um, for a long time, people also thought that maybe there was some dysregulation of the blood-brain barrier in germinal matrix hemorrhage, but at least so far, we don't see that as playing a role using this data set. So here's um, some of the adherence junction proteins um, that I'm showing in these violin plots, looking at um, the different uh, genes specifically in our cases and controls, um, and then in our, all of our different vascular subtypes on the uh, x-axis. And here um, are some of the occludins to represent the tight junction proteins. So in summary, um, we're building toward an updated two-hit model for germinal matrix hemorrhage, where we think that there's an underlying vascular cell cellular immaturity in this region. And on top of that, that there's some cellular damage via hypoxia or um, oxidative stress. And I welcome your comments on this uh, model. Um, so that's all the data that I have today. I'll just give some appreciation um, to my lab, whose members as of last summer are shown here, which is a really you know, hardworking and inspiring group of young people. I can, I'm listing some of my mentors on the right, including my postdoc mentor, Eric Wong, Fernando, of course, who runs the molecular medicine program, which got me started on all of this, Tippy McKenzie, who's now the um, Stem Cell Institute director, um, and really a lot of appreciation to the NICU parents and families. Um, I'm uh, very active on Twitter, and so you can um, talk with me there where, I, you know, I learn about, I love science Twitter. I find it very productive. And also, you know, I'm very grateful to some of my funding agencies, to all of my funding agencies, some of which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, and I'll just highlight the um, PSDP, as well as the Preterm Birth Initiative, which was also very instrumental. Uh, the CIRM Alpha Stem Cell Clinic funded me as well as during my fellowship, and that was really um, helpful. And of course, the UCSF Physician Scientist uh, Scholars Program. Um, and with that, I'll leave you on a mesmerizing um, GIF of some of our vascular cells, and I can take questions. Thank you, Betsy. That was that was marvelous. Uh, let's see if people have questions for Betsy. Mark. Hey Betsy, that was that was terrific. Um, um, and congratulations on your career trajectory, which looks very, very positive. I wanted to ask a, a hematology uh, question, which uh, has to do with uh, globin switching, which, as you know, in 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 the in the age uh, gestational age infants that you're talking about, the the fetal to adult globin switch is already pretty far along. And I, I'm just curious if with the fetal hemoglobin, if you could extend that or keep it induced, which has a higher affinity for oxygen, so wouldn't deliver as much oxygen to the tissues, would, would that be would that be helpful, or is it actually the opposite that you would want to do, which is to to accelerate globin switching and get the adult hemoglobin? Yeah, you know, thank you for thinking about this. You know, like sort of in a in a different uh, with a different perspective. Now that we can start to understand like the vascular vulnerabilities, one of the things that I'm a little stuck on th the moment is like exactly how to use this data to think about therapeutics. So yeah, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll say that some of the things that we're trying to figure out is, you know, is this really, is it hypoxia or is it um, like an oxygen free, rattles, free radical toxicity? Mm -hmm. So the fortunate thing is that we can take these vascular cells and grow them in culture. So we're starting, you know, along with um, with Emmons advice to um, 
to just do some culture experiments and hypoxia or, you know, actually normal oxygen tension, which would be hyperoxic for these babies to, to understand which direction we need to go. So I think once we figure that out, then I'll be able to answer your question about whether fe feeble hemoglobin would be helpful. But yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we are very interested um, and, and I'll, you know, give appreciation to you for, you know, for, for the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Fellowship, because I think the way that, you know, blood cell people are starting to mm, mobilize therapeutics, we just haven't gotten there in neuroscience yet. Something I'm really excited about is the idea of using like therapeutic um, blood derived vascular cells, because in, um, I don't know if we've talked about this, but in adults who have received bone marrow transplantation for, you know, different hematopoietic malignancies, there's a current clinical trial by a company called Angiocrine Biosciences, where they're infusing endothelial cells, circulating endothelial cells, and they find that they um, migrate to the areas that are injured, specifically in the gut is the most helpful. And they mm -hmm. they really decrease their rates of diarrhea and mucositis. So we're wondering if we could infuse therapeutic endothelial cells in babies after hemorrhage. And, um, you know, for this, they have a huge advantage because we can actually get them from their own umbilical cord. So that's something that um, I've been talking to, you know, Liz Rogers and others about potentially getting that going after we do some proof of concept with uh, animal studies. Thanks. Hey, Jim. So um, I've asked this question of others. I don't want to keep asking the same, but whenever I see transcriptomic data like this, I'm intrigued by um, co connectivity map drug repurposing. Mm -hmm. Have you um, considered any of that as a um, possible um, therapeutic avenue for some of these data sets? Yeah, I'd love to talk about this more. I, I think we I'm not sure that we have a good functional assay. You know, I showed you the organoid transplants. That was, I think, a good first pass. But we're working on, let's say, a better, more representative functional assay, you know, to represent developing vascular cells. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit offline on, on whether you think I have a good assay. This, these are very, <laughs> very um, um, nascent ideas. So I may... in. Um an enthusiastic um, promoter of it. Um, we've um, we've not tried it yet with some of our um, placental and preeclampsia stuff, but we're we're on the verge of it. So there is a maven here as well. Um, great. Yeah, let's talk more. Okay, great. Well, as Dr. Hirsch was saying, I did just talk at the Fellows College. So <laughs> I think if there aren't any further questions. Um, I'm happy to, you know, you can hit me up via email or on Twitter. Thanks, Betsy. Both talks were fabulous. Uh, so uh, thank you for presenting again on such uh, so quickly after last week, but they were both really exciting talks and you're doing great work. Really appreciate uh, hearing about it. And uh We'll wish everybody a good week. Yeah, we'll okay. give everyone five minutes back. So thanks again for your attention. Thanks.